session. Excellent. So um, the recording has started and we will go ahead and begin. So welcome everyone to um, our webinar um, on, oh sorry, the, the poll is still there, transforming the classroom through the standards for mathematical practice with Karen Walker. And we're very lucky to have her with us today. Um, Karen, do you want to um, talk a little bit about your brief orientation? Um, sure. Um, sure. I mean, the most important thing um, that we remember is that this is an ongoing dialogue um, and that um, there are, the issues we're presenting today have been well thought out by me, but of course, um, what, what your opinions are, what your needs are, really are going to you know, dictate the future conversations. So um, one thing I'm hoping is that people will stay engaged by using the chat window, by writing questions down as they come up to you. Uh, we won't stop and answer every question. We'll get those at the end. But just so that we can get a sense of what um, is on people's minds, what are challenges, what are people excited about, that would be really helpful. Excellent. And, uh, did you want to talk about the Blackboard features? Yes, um, so I'm just going to run us through a quick orientation to um, Blackboard Collaborate and we had this test your audio up, so hopefully you've all had a chance to test your audio. Um, this is just a quick overview of the meeting interface. So there's a whiteboard, um, there's a toolbar that we'll be using in just a second. Um, there's the little audio video window, um, you can see a list of the participants, and then there's a chat window. So um, if everybody could just take a second to just find an emoticon and just use it very quickly, um, you can have a smiley face, you can applaud, um, you, can, you can indicate approval. We also, um, there's also um, little icons for faster or for slower. So I'd like to encourage you all um, to experiment with these emoticons um, just because I think it's kind of a nice way to show, you know, that, that, that there is an audience out there listening. Sometimes when I'm presenting via Collaborate, it can feel a little isolating. So yes, um, and I see Wacom has put their hand up. Yes, Wacom, what's up? Oh, um, oh, maybe, and I think maybe actually you might be um, just playing around. So there, so there is a raise hand um, icon, so you can raise your hand when you wish to speak. Um, so Watcom, did you have a question, or were you just um, using the the raise hand? Okay. So. Um, the the chat room is fairly simple. You know, you can just type in what you, uh, your name and or type in your questions. Um, and then to your left are whiteboard tools. And it's kind of the long skinny bar. And so if everybody could please um, hover over the star icon and click on that. And then we're going to do a brief activity. So here is a map of Washington State, and if you could please put a star for where you are. So I'm going to put a star there because I'm in Olympia. So if everybody could please just show where they are, and I'm realizing that we have somebody from Oregon on this call, and of course Karen herself is in San Diego, so maybe you might put yourself off the map <laughs> in the sort of um, the general area. So thank you, very, thank you, that's wonderful. And on the next slide, we're just going to experiment with the polling feature. So um, I'm going to set up the poll. Here we go. So it's A through D. Whoops. Sorry. Um, polling. There we go. OK, A through D, multiple choice. Um, so if you could, um, how much do you know about the 2014 GED? And it looks like people are starting, so if you, if you look to um, respond to the poll, are you an expert? Have you attended a webinar or training? Um, my colleagues are talking about it, or GED what? The GED has changed. So if you could go ahead and fill out that poll. 
perfect. And I am going to publish the responses. So if you can see that, it looks like six people did not answer, but five people are in that middle category. So thank you for participating. That's great. Um, so on our next slide, uh, raise your hand so we can call on you in a timely manner. Use emoticons to indicate approval or a job well done. Um, if you could click on your talk button if you do want to talk, um, and then click it off again when you're finished. And then type your questions into the chat as we go, and we'll revisit them during the Q&A. So um, like, hopefully what we'll do is we'll hold questions until the end, but um, you know, just so Karen can move through her material. But feel free to type your questions into the chat window so you don't forget them. And, I'll, and then we'll begin there during the Q&A session. All right, any questions or are we ready to go? Go, excellent, okay. all right. Karen, take it away. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, so just a brief overview. We're going to briefly look at the changes in the GED, um, look at, at a broad, broad stroke of that, look at a little bit of the trends of institutional responses. And most of those responses have been around structural change and curricular change. And then, then we're going to spend the bulk of our time looking at the demands and the opportunities for pedagogical change. We'll look at some pra the, the practices themselves, um, some ideas about norms, some important ideas or research that might frame your the way you think about and um, supporting where you might go first with pedagogical change to approach the new demands of the GED. And we're not going to get stated, we're going to get started about talk about some ideas on how to get started and look at some content resources that are um, some of the many resources that are on online right now. So the GED has already shifted. It's a new test. Um, it started this this um, spring, and it's the math portion of the exam has an incredible more weight upon algebra. Um, students will be asked to interpret graphs, to um, understand how to use lines and polynomials, and equalities and radicals. Um, that's the questions. The curriculum is requiring foundational conceptual understanding and that the problems they're designing for students to complete on the assessment uh, would require students to have conceptual, conceptual algebraic foundations. Um, it would be hard to, it's hard to imagine someone memorizing enough procedures to be successful on the test. And I think it's important to think about what's oriented this change. People didn't sit down in the room and say, you know what we need to do is we need to make the GED harder because we should have fewer students passing the GED. But that's not the framework. The framework is rather that we need students preparing in classes and showing their mastery of ideas and concepts that make them career ready and college ready. So the curriculum um, has taken into account the Common Core state standards and industry needs to rethink what needs to be on the mathematical test. So in terms of the assessment, and students have to take, take the GED, they're, they're going to be looking at conceptually demanding problems, problems that require the students to think about a problem-solving strategy that then uses foundational skills. There's um, much less emphasis on assessment questions that are simply uh, um, arithmetic. The questions themselves assume the use and the strategic use of arithmetic skills, numeric numerical skills. Another big shift on the calculator, on, on the assessment, is that there's a calculator on the computer for the whole test except for five problems that are at the beginning of the test. And in addition, there's a guide on the computer that shows the students what buttons to press on the calculator to do certain kinds of calculations. And that's a, a sheet that if a student wanted to know how do I find 40% to 200, 
they could look up on the guide sheet and they could see a guide of how to, which buttons to press on the calculator. The calculator can't be brought in by the student, but the student, the calculator is on the computer. So there's also a formal sheet available, but because of these tools, it's simply not going to be enough for the students to study up on tips and tricks to do a certain set of problems. Um, and <clears throat> the one thing to look at is students, if students and faculty would look at the new content and the new questions on the GED, it can feel like overwhelming changes because you have the same students in your classroom that you had yesterday. So now there's a new um, test that has a whole new set, a whole new flavor of demands. So the good news is that there are lots of people and institutions working on responses. And the positive issue with, um, with the GED focusing on the Common Core state standards is that they can look to the same resources being developed to support that big shift to support the shifts that you want to see in your own classroom to make sure your students are going to be successful as they move into college or careers. So here are some of the big structural responses we're seeing at different community colleges. Um, one is that people are looking at delivery of learning. That's saying we need to have lots of different kinds of classes to be available to the diversity of the lives of our students. So for example, making sure that there's classes that are hybrid classes that maybe have a part online and part in class, or classes that meet in the evening or, in, or meet in long blocks so that students who have a big chunk of time can, and know they're going to learn that way can take advantage of that. So colleges are sitting down and saying, who are our students and how can we deliver these classes in a way that makes sense for their lives and make sure we're giving students options that will support their, um, their life conditions and life demands. There's also many examples um, showing up of accelerated programs. This usually involves saying that our usual program where students maybe were coming to class four times a week for 50 minutes, let's have them come five times a week for three hours a day. Let's put in tutoring support, instructional support. Let's do a lot of math every day and have students get through a lot of the math requirements, a lot of the math requirements focus on math almost exclusively in their academic program to get through the mathematics before life events intervene. Um, there's also some projects um, that um, the state of Washington is, is involved in, IBEST and High School 21, looking at saying, can we redefine basic skills math that is really looking at the competencies people have in their life and that get students ready for skills. Um, there's also modular approaches of saying we need to make sure that we put some math topics in a compartment and let students finish those and hold on uh, to their accomplishments, even if they um, only finished a portion of the class's um, learning outcomes, they could still hold their place in that knowledge and then pick up from that learning, learning ability in their next class. And there's also people experimenting with side-by-side -side support and just-in-time learning. That's saying starting students in classes that are demanding um, beyond where a placement test would put them, but say that's okay, we're just going to vary the level of side-by-side -side support we offer these students so they can succeed and get through math more quickly. So um, those, that's an example of the kinds of programs we're seeing. Uh, and there's different levels of technology use that are being used at different programs like this. Um, this is a brief overview of some curricular responses. Um, this is one program I know um, something about personally, which is um, Scottsdale College at Maricopa Community Colleges has worked very hard, and mostly because several of them um, went and got their PhD all from the same local university, and they all um, started working together and talking a lot together about how students learn. And they wanted to create um, their own resources that would attend to vocabulary and constructs and keep those vocabulary constructs consistent throughout the whole student's developmental um, math um, story. So for example, um, they use a construct where multiplic multiplication is copies. They talk about what's three times four. Well, three, three fours is four copies of, of four. Then they extend that construct into even fractions where they 
keep saying to students, if you have five sevenths, then you have five copies of one seventh. So um, we'll talk a little bit later with a website that connects you to their um, their textbook and resources we've created um, by working together with that dedication to curriculum that is consistent, uses consistent vocabulary, and consistent um, experience to learning opportunities for the students. There's also the curricular responses of pathways. That's a Carnegie model of looking at ways to help students um, stay, stay in the cohort over a year and, and get through mathematics more quickly with a very intentional plan. The Dana Center is doing a lot of good work around curriculum responses. And then there's also work happening in many different directions of saying not every student is going to take calculus. What's the kind of mathematics that would support their college success and the career readiness um, that would support their ability to be quantitative, quantitatively literate and be able to reason quantitatively in their life? OK, so those are the general trends. But let's now get into the idea of these mathematical practices. The mathematical practices are standards that are in the Common Core State Standards that are being applied um, and present K through 12. So every student at kindergarten through 12th grade is asking in their classroom to be practicing these modes of approaches and dialogue and cultural approaches to mathematics. So even in a kindergarten classroom, we want to think about how does a kindergartner attend to a precision? How does a third grader look for an inclusive structure? So if we can go on a tour of this for a moment, one of the challenges with these standards is understanding what they, what they look like in your classroom. So I just want to briefly go to a website that does some really good thinking about making the standards alive for you. So this is work um, that is being supported by the Data Center and other organizations. And they listed the standards here, each, or each a link. Let's look at uh, standard eight, looking for and expressing regularity in repeated reasoning. If we click on this, what comes up is the explanation from the Common Core Standards and then as you drag through here and go down the website, you can see that they've done some videos and in a lesson and some commentary on the side at every grade level. So you can see how this standard might, um, might um, come to life in each level of classrooms. So we don't have time in the space of this webinar to um, engage in these videos, but I wanted to um, visit it. Let's go back to the top and say this really makes um, this would be a bookmark on my web my web browser where I would come to and I would revisit these and look at these videos and think about what's my understanding of how these practices come to light in different classes. So that's um, so let's. We're going to talk about these a little bit more. We're going to deconstruct them and have some examples. And uh, what I want to point out is that each of these standards, I mean, I talk to faculty about what do these standards look like for you, how do you imagine them coming up in your classroom. I hear different kinds of um, ideas and constructs and imaginings about how these standards would take place in the class. And that's a really useful conversation to have with your colleagues. Um, even looking at student work or a student, um, a problem you're putting in front of a student and ask yourself, how do we think this problem would support um, students' ability to construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others? Does this problem we're going to have students work on today have avenues for students to actually to engage in viable arguments and think about the reasoning of others? Does this problem have an issue where students are going to need to think about and attend to precision? And Simply those questions with your colleagues will help refine and support your ability to think about how these um, standards can approach your, uh, both your curriculum shifts and your pedagogical shifts. So we're going to talk more about that. OK, so I'm going to, um, maybe we can do, if you would be so kind as to use a, an emoticon of some sort 
to let me know if any of you know about a number talk. Does that ring a bell with people? I see some people responding. So a, a number talk is a well-suggested way to think about I'm going to do something different in my classroom, and I need student buy-in. I have to realize that students in my class are have expectations and ideas about what a math classroom looks like, which in America often looks like a teacher in the front of the room explaining math. But the practice standards really are about giving space in the classroom to look at student thinking and um, student ideas and students doing mathematics. So we want to demonstrate to students that their thinking matters, that every student's thinking is valued in the classroom, and that in your classroom space, student voices and ideas will be heard. Um, I just saw the audio is a bit muddy, so I'm going to try and speak more directly into the microphone. So one of the best ways to represent to your students that, uh, that their thinking is valuable is to do a number talk. The number talk is public thinking about a doable problem. So I have an example, and I think the best thing to do is to watch this. I'm so bold as to share this. So let's get to this. My good friend David let me record me, and here it is. Uh, so we're going to do a number talk. And uh, this is something where we're going to examine our thinking. And we're going to need you to put down your digital um, and your paper, and this is map that you in your head. And I want to make sure when it's time to think about it. So when you're finished, I want you to put your hand on your chest um, and put your thumb up on the application. I don't want you to shout the answer or raise your hand because you know, a lot of us, as soon as it happens, we just stop things. So I'm going to get everyone playing time to say, if you're um, find a solution to this problem or break in your head and you might not see if you can engage yourself by finding another way and you find a second way to just think back to what you could have done Okay. So, um, are all those pencils down, all the paper? <laughs> all right. So, uh, again, I'll leave when you pop this. Karen, um, I just stopped the video because I think you need to mute your mic. Um, could you um, could you mute the phone and then I'll press play again because we we're hearing a lot of um, echo. Okay, let's see what happens.
Okay, I've unmuted. Is that better? I'm getting an echo back. Is that better? What about that? Is that better? Yeah, that, that's okay. got it now. Sorry, about, sorry, about, sorry about that. That was weird. Okay. Thank you for bringing me through that technical issue. Sorry about the feedback. Now I'm smarter. No worries. This is just part of the beauty and failure of technology, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the 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 um the risk of showing that number text video is that representing um, a number talk I think is best um, by seeing and and showing the idea. The idea is that you want to solicit um, student ideas. So one of the most important important practices of that number talk going well is the thumb voting with your fist um, on your chest and indicate having students not public indicate when their thinking is done. Um, we, we know from research and we know from practical experiences that students that are used to a faculty member or an instructor asking them a question and that they don't have to think about it because the teacher will move on as, as soon as someone else answers it. So that thumb voting is one of the most important um, parts of representing to students that the class is going to value the thinking of everyone. And it's also a great place as a practitioner to work on your skill of waiting for students um, and using pauses and knowing that you can wait longer than your students can. Um, you have more patience than your students so that you can wait out um, their impatience and someone's going to share an idea. So um, let's go on to this. So another tool in terms of bringing in the practices is to engage in formative assessment as opposed to just summative assessments that give students grades about what learning outcomes they've met or not met. So formative assessment questions are questions that you use to take the student responses to inform your teaching. Questions on performative assessment are designed to reveal what students understand and particularly give you insight into emergent learning. So someone out there in the world who's doing a lot of work on this is called Dylan William. He has an active a website um, in the UK. And this is one of his um, examples about really thinking about the kinds of questions you're asking. So it turns out if you ask students the first question, he's asked this to many, many students in different places, which fraction is smallest, people are pretty successful. And the idea he, he throws out um, in terms of student conceptual understanding is that people believe they know that bigger denominators make smaller fractions. And the next question um, is designed in such a way so that you can actually, as an instructor, get a sense of the emergent learning in your classroom and where students, let students understand where they might just begin be starting to get ideas. So with this question, 39% of people he's given this test to, and um, where this is their learning outcome, they pick three-fourths as the wrong solution. And um, his thinking on this is that because students are still working to pick B, they're still working with the idea that fourths are bigger than fifths, and fourths are bigger than eighths, and they're bigger than tenths. So that's um, the idea of designing a question on purpose from your practitioner knowledge of what is shaky sometimes as students are learning a new idea so that you can get a sense of where students are having emerging learning of concepts. Again, um, sometimes these questions are called hinge questions. Hinge like a door hinge, because as students are turning the corner on learning, these kinds of questions can, in each response, can give you insight into what students are understanding as they learn a new concept. So, okay. Okay, so another issue with um, shifting your classroom so that there's space for the practices to emerge, for students to know that their voice is valued and that they can begin to have a dialogue with each other and with you about 
their thinking is to be aware about, intentionally aware about changing the mathematical script. In general, again, this is in American math classrooms. This isn't in every classroom, but this is the, what emerges is that there's a, a response that's called um, um, IER. Um, that's an inquiry and a response. IRE, rather, sorry, inquiry, response, and evaluation. So I ask my students, what's half of a fourth? I hear somebody say an eighth. I say right. And then we move on to the next topic. So research has just shown for um, a good amount of time that no matter what classroom, math classrooms, language arts classrooms, we, we use uh, inquiry and response followed by uh, evaluate, evaluative response. Overall, those classrooms tend to have less student engagement and class participation. Um, instead, if we work on developing the skills to probe into student thinking and press students for ideas, if our responses um, support that probing and that curiosity about students thinking, as opposed to evaluating the culture and the script of the classroom begins to shift where students learn how to have mathematical dialogue and understand the tenets of mathematical reasoning. So again, um, here's a longer script. Of, um, and this is my imagining. This is not from, a, from an actual dialogue. But this is um, an idea of a teacher and a student dialogue where the teacher is pushing for the student to articulate. And this dialogue, um, as a teacher, when I'm wanting students to think about fractions, I really am wanting to push them to, the, to articulate the idea of their thinking until they mention a whole. An eighth is, a, is a, an eighth of what is often my question. A fourth of what, an eighth of what. And um, so again, the idea is to probe student thinking, and especially when students are correct, and as well as when students have responses that surprise you and seem to represent conceptual misunderstandings, right answers also deserve the respect of probing into student thinking and pressing for students to explain how they came about um, their ideas. There's also something that um, in the developmental math classroom that people have spent some time, especially um, Grubb and Associates at um, Norton Grubb and Associates in California have looked at a lot of looked into developmental classrooms and they've defined something called remedial pedagogy. Um, they did a working paper in 2011 looking into lots of classrooms and they defined remedial pedagogy to be pedagogy when we teach parts trying to get to a whole, when we focus on procedures, rules, isolated ideas, and worksheets that where students practice skills. Um, their, their claim in that working paper is that these, um, these norms, these ideas of how we teach the pedagogical approaches aren't serving students well, uh, to become college ready and career ready. And what their, um, their wondering was about what would, be ha what would happen if we taught students from the big picture to the parts we focused on concepts as opposed to procedures, if we made explicit the larger themes in the learning, if we provided them context instead of isolated ideas, and if we gave them problems to solve, and as they were solving those problems, they were using foundational skills in the service of that more relevant um, problem in their life. So again, there's a call for us to rethink and have discussions as colleagues um, how much is the remedial pedagogy supporting student goals as opposed to this pedagogy reimagined by the practices? Okay, so let's talk again. Maybe um, you're like, okay, I want to put a practice in, into, into play, but you know, I still need to make sure students are understanding the mathematics that I know they are challenged with. Students coming into developmental math um, studies have shown really have a confusion about um, decimals, fractions, and percents and how they relate to each other. So as opposed to giving a student a worksheet, you could give this tool as both formative assessment and also a format for a classroom discussion. 
so that students work individually. Students work, work individually to respond in their private return to these questions and to write down an explanation and then turn towards a partner and discuss their ideas. And then use the silent chess voting technique here to say, OK, who says yes? Who says no? Who would like to defend yes? Who would like to defend no? And to, to again, support mathematical argumentation to justify and come to some, some consensus through mathematical ideas about which of these are equivalent. So again, instead of having a worksheet that's about these, actually having a mathematical dialogue that pushes for understanding and also uncovers the, the conceptual challenges and the understanding students have in the room to think about these things. Um, here's another technique to bring the practices in your classroom. And I have a couple of examples in um, a Dropbox folder. We'll share the link with you at the end of card sorts. So again, card sorts are a way for students to work on noticing what is equivalent. So the general format is to start with 16 cards, where there are four groups of four. Um, for example, you could have multiple representations of, of lines. You could have tables of the same line. You could have a graph of the same line, an equation, and a description. So you could have four different linear relationships represented in those four different representations. You can mix the cards up, hand them to a set of two, or two to four students, and have them sort the cards. But the most important part of this activity is to then push the students to verify their solutions. When I do this activity and the cards, students do the card sort, they'd like to call me over and say, hey, did I do it right? And I have to ask them, how would you know if you're right? How would you go about checking? And leave them to that. And then push them to share with their, with their partners about their sorting and think about what was easy to sort and what was hard to sort. So card sorts are they're a popular activity. Students engage in them. They're, they, people have played cards. The idea of sorting gets them engaged. Um, groups of two works really well. Sometimes groups of four, the task is large enough to engage four people. Way, ways to increase the, the challenge of a card sort is students maybe um, get used to the task and you want to ramp it up is to put a card into the deck of the intentional air. Or take some of the cards out and put blank cards in the deck and have them fill in the missing card. Um, there's also an idea of creating a card set that has two reasonable sets possible. That depending on students' thinking, they could sort it using rule A or sort it using rule B, and students could talk about their, their thinking and their, their organizational rubrics. So we have two examples of card sorts um, on the uh, in the Dropbox for you to try. Here's um, another topic. As you noticed, there's a lot of algebra requirements in the GED. And again, we're not, we want to avoid the trap of getting students ready for, thanks Jennifer for sharing that bitly. We want to avoid the trap of getting students ready for a test. We want to get them ready for college and their career goals. So algebraic thinking, again, we want to, to think about how to engage students in recognizing that they already can see patterns. Most students, if they look at this pattern, begin to see a pattern emerging. Um, there's something missing underneath this slide. It should be version 1, version 2, and this is version 4. This graphic, I'm just noticing, is missing a four underneath here. So this is stage one, this is stage two, and this is stage four. So again, with this, thank you. Um, with this, with this pattern, again, like a number talk, you would ask students, "What do you see? How do you see a pattern here?" Um, for example, I see shorter columns and taller columns shorter columns and taller columns. 
shorter columns and taller columns. And the taller columns are always one level higher than the shorter columns. So that might be how I see this. Some other student might say, no, I don't see that. I see a row on the bottom with two on top. And for stage two, I see two rows on the bottom with two on top. For stage four, I see four, and then it's a two on top. So again, you can have a student conversation about what do students see here. Can you build the third stage? Can you build the fifth stage? What about the tenth stage? What about the hundredth stage? So again, um, students are pushed then to think algebraically and to build a sense of generalization that they could predict what the middle stage is, what the next stage is. They could probably even predict in words a description of the hundredth stage. So again, um, an example of this is in uh, the Bitly documents about how to have students value students' thinking and look at even if I describe it one way, you describe the pattern another way, we're still describing the same pattern and we can look for some equivalency in our representations. Um, this work was is inspired by the work of um, the Mathematics Education Collaborative, um, where Ruth Parker has come around to the state of Washington and done different workshops that supports looking at patterns that we know from testing that kindergartners can recognize and then pushing um, students into higher order thinking to recognize a pattern and then use a variable to recognize the pattern. Okay, so another topic. So in your classroom, when you're looking at ways to start shifting your culture so that students can engage in the practices, the most important part is to realize that Students are engaging in practice. It's not you. Students need to be aware of their own thinking. So questions that are metacognitive that require, require students to think about their own thinking, to think about their own processes, help students pause for a moment and notice how they're learning and engage in their mathematical conceptual formation. So again, um, here, there's many metacognitive types of questions, and here are some of them. Um, I am um, often, when I'm thinking about a test review, and I know that a, 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 a unit test is coming up, I give students sample questions, but I ask them not to do the question. I ask them to answer this question. What would someone have to know to answer this question efficiently and accurately? And I have them write down those topics. Um, the same question is similar. How confident are you that can you solve this problem? Why are you confident or not confident? Um, ask me students after a couple of weeks, what do you understand now that you did not know as, um, as you began this class? Um, again, um, somewhere into this this sixth, seventh week of the course, what advice would you give someone enrolling in this course? Again, this, this question is asked to, to reflect upon the personal practices, practices that are leading to success. And this is a, if you're looking at curriculum that you can't easily change and you have curriculum that is problems, you know, sheets and sheets of problems, and that's what you have to teach with, you can pull out a, a worksheet and simply just ask the students, sort these problems into problems that are similar, to ask them to look at the structure of the questions. And the same idea here is it's a metacognitive question that's asking students to look at the structure and repeated expression, which is one of the standards, to look at a problem and say, can you write another problem and have it be the same kind of problem? Again, asking students to notice um, structure in their own, their own learning. So here's another approach, which is, which is a, sometimes a demanding shift for teachers. When I first was teaching students who seemed to me they were mathematically fragile, 
my my instinct was to break problems down to very small bits and to give students lots of hints and structure because I thought then they could be successful at some point of the problem, at some point of the task to get into the problem. Um, but so, some research is saying that what you want to do is to limit the scaffolding so you can find out with students what they know, um, not what they don't know. So we want to look at, when we limit scaffolding, as opportunities again for formative assessment to see what student knowledge is in the room and what kind of experience is in the classroom to approach problems. So some of you who, um, who know me know I'm very fond of this problem. This is a problem that was adopted from something I've seen at some point that had a lot of data on it and had about 10 problem questions right after it. And my experiment was to take off the numerical data and ask students, what can you determine from this graph? And the situation uh, about this graph is that um, I informed the students that every car was on a, a track, every car started with a full gas tank, and everybody drove at 60 miles per hour at a constant rate until there was no more gas. So when I had put this in front of, of students at different levels and backgrounds, students have been able to engage in this, in this part of what can you determine. And as they're having conversations, I get a sense of the knowledge in the classroom. Um, what do students understand about rates of change? How do they, what do they understand about this line sloping downwards more steeply than this line? What does it mean to them in this context? What does it mean to them that this line starts here and uh, driver D starts here? So again, um, the scaffolding is off and the question is what kind of knowledge do students have when they look at this problem? So there's some follow-up questions is to ask the students and take time about what can you determine, what questions do you have, and what else do you want to know? So again, the questions, not scaffolded, but the prompts are specific. And the prompts are letting me know where students have, have questions as well as have knowledge. And then the follow-up task is to give them more information about driver A. Then um, working individually then with groups, I can see what, what, how do students um, interpret this kind of problem, even though this might seem um, advanced for students who's tested into basic skills, we know that students have seen graphs, they see data, and by asking students this question, and other them have dialogue about it, they can see what students understand in the room and how they can make use of emergent knowledge in the room. If a student explains to them that this point uh, means that uh, the driver A must have a gas tank that holds 42 gallons, um, that students, the students can have that dialogue and that uh, understanding of order of pairs begins to um, be emergent public knowledge in the classroom. Again, there's a next task of saying, now that you have those order pairs, could you add order pairs? Again, that gives me an opportunity to see with the students what do they know about taking this information and making judgments about other values that might make sense on this graph? And then, um, again, there's space here for students to think about what you know. This activity just gives you a sense of letting students really think about determining what they know, what they want to know, engaging with this information, and looking at this, depending on how engaged students are, what kinds of conversations are happening, it can extend over one class period or two class periods. And um, it's something you come back to in a unit when you're talking about um, linear relationships. Again, it's an opportunity when you work through a problem like that is to have students, again, Think about some metacognitive questions about 
what happened when they got stuck or unstuck? Um, how do you know you understand the ideas that you mentioned? You know, did you learn any math skills while thinking about this problem? And to write those down. And even to take, um, for, um, in your, uh, chart, chart this out in your classroom to make the knowledge generated from a problem like this, to make it public, make it the classroom's knowledge. Okay, so we talked about um, several different ideas about mathematical approaches, and I don't know, again, I don't know how many people have heard about Dan Meyer. So this is a, this is a, a, an instructor um, who had a blog, he has a blog, and here it is, there's his blog, and he, his blog was catch, caught to me both eyes that he was invited to a TED talk about his math approach. And I wanted to put this website right here, which is his blog, where he talks in detail about his three acts approach. So the blog says, mrmeyer.com, 2013, teaching with three acts. Um, and it goes through his idea of act one, act two, and act three. But um, his point is that he wants people to understand that his teaching approach is more than just having students watch a video and see what happens. So let's go take a look at um, his website, and we're going to take a look at Nana's Milk. So let's pull this up. There's 101 questions or videos. And I know something about this, right? I need to press let me get this going. Sorry, oh, this is a strange thing. Something strange is showing up here. Is it not what you expected to see? I don't expect to see th this free cell game. Do you see something strange? I see 101 questions. I see search, create, top 10, join. Oh, where, it's, do you, where it says skip it, I'm bored, or submit and see next. Is that what's strange? No, there's, some, it's, uh, there's something odd about my screen. Hold on. OK. Can you, can you drive for me on what you see? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, when you say so drive. You see. I'm saying I can't. If you can see a website, that would be great. Yes, I can see. I and, can see a website. Okay, hold on. I'm going to do something different. Hold on. Okay. Pardon me. Be patient. No worries. Fun times. You know, I I do think that we're all learning <laughs> as you do this, <laughs> and. You know, in technology, just sometimes it takes a while to learn it, and we're all learning the capabilities. Well, while, while we're so working on this, exactly why don't we take, take, take a moment question. to see if folks, if people have questions or up to this point area. It's interesting. I think that it seems like the video in, oper, operates independently. I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just moderators, but I clicked on it, and it played for me. So I don't know if anybody, obviously, you guys didn't see it, though, when I clicked play, so. Well, the, I'm even trying to, hold on. It shouldn't have just gone to Nana's, I mean, if you went to Nana's, okay, here we go. Okay, so here's, I'm there now. Can other people see this? I see driving 35 miles per hour. It seems like it, we're all seeing slightly different things. You see in the chat window, <laughs> baseball <laughs> game, Oreos, picture of a sky at night. Yeah, see, we're all seeing different things. So maybe you ought to just point out the uh, site to them, uh, Karen, and move on. Or, yeah, I'm just trying to think of, she could give us the URL, and we could all go to it on our computers. Oh, that might take, yeah. 
Oh, now I see Nana's chocolate milk. Yes, um, so I see Nana's chocolate milk too now. All right, people are there, it sounds like. Okay, sorry about that. All right, here. So, so exciting, Nana's chocolate milk. Karen, did you press play? I did press play. Okay, I think we might all have to press play on our own because um, mine's not playing. Everybody should individually press play. Everybody individually press play. Yes. Okay, I'm hoping 48 seconds has gone by. So on this website, if you scroll down lower, you can see Act 1, and the question is, is there any way to fix it? Act 2 is to ask students, how many different solutions can you find, and introduces a limit that, oh, by the way, the glass won't hold two cups of milk. How does that affect your solution? And then um, there's an answer video, and then there's another follow-up question. So let me go back. There's, Anna's. there's um, again, this is a searchable website of 101 scenarios to go through. And this is very typical of, of Dan Mayer's approach, that he has a video to watch and then initiate student engagement from that provocative situation. So that's what we would call Act 1. It's a provocative situation that has some relevance. And then students um, can access their own, their own um, knowledge and think about how to approach the problem. But there is there's intentional structure. There's intentional learning outcomes. And, and um, what I would uh, propose to you is that that chocolate milk 48-second um, video is a lot more interesting than a worksheet of two variable, two unknowns um, problems where you're working with percents and mixtures. It, it just um, frames it differently and engages students in the video age we're in. So again, um, his, um, his, on his website, you can search through, through those 101 questions even by putting in um, outcomes. I found Nana's milk by putting in the search engine, by putting in uh, ratios, and Nana's milk came up, came up. If you put in quadratics or parabolas, there's a question about a basketball. Okay. Okay, so let's just pause for a moment that the video created a little bit of pause for itself, is that I just wanted to reflect in a very authentic way that changing our pedagogy is hard. It's rewarding work, but it is hard work. It means taking a risk. It means testing out ideas um, in your classroom. And um, when you do things differently, even as I'm giving this webinar, different outcomes happen that you can't predict. And as a faculty member and instructor, you'll, you'll be out of your comfort zone and you'll have to you know, have that wonderful rewarding experience of recovering and making on your feet. So it's, it's hard rewarding work. So um, if I can suggest a plan, make a plan and think about what's one change you want to engage in your classroom pedagogy, in your classroom culture in the next week, in the next two weeks, in the next three weeks, even in the whole classroom. What's one innovation that I want to focus on and hone my skill at? And if you can, engage as a buddy. Or find a colleague who's also wondering, knowing that the GD has changed, and instructional practices have to shift, um, trying out a practice together, and then engage in visiting each other's classrooms and looking at um, focusing on students' engagement and what's working, what could be improved, and commit to getting better with each other. That, that 
that process is um, it's important to acknowledge that changing and shifting your pedagogy is its own learning process, its own challenging process for you. The other challenge is to realize that you have to consider student buy-in. Students have a defined script of how math class has gone for them, what happens in math classes, and the standards for mathematical practice really shift the emphasis on to student thinking. And we have to remember that we have to engage that student buy-in. Um, because what you're doing in your math class as you're adjusting and responding to the practice standards is you're establishing different socio-mathematical norms. So if you're into um, academic reading, um, in 1996, Paul Cobb and his colleague, um, Eve Yackel, worked together and identified socio-mathematical norms. So again, their, their assertion was that norms in math classes are different than just social norms. For example, uh, social norm in the classroom is we should question each other's thinking. But in the math classroom, when we question each other's thinking, we're pressing for mathematical reasoning. We're pressing for justification and understanding using mathematical terminology and concepts. Again, we want students to explain their ways of thinking in any class, but in mathematical classrooms, we want to press students to use mathematical arguments when they explain solutions. And again, we might culturally and socially have a norm that we learn from mistakes, but in mathematics, when we make mistakes and we notice errors, there are opportunities to rethink our concepts and to wonder, wait a second, does this idea always work or is there a contradiction here? And mistakes um, in that math and for mathematicians lead to new learning about mathematics. So again, you're doing something very challenging, which is to shift the, the habits, the social habits in your classroom where students begin to, to be using and negotiate the socio-mathematical um, ways of speaking and discourse that lead to reasoning, justification, and mathematical understanding, and learning how to have mathematical arguments that are focused on ideas and language. Okay, so we, um, a lot of the ideas behind the GED is to get students, again, career ready, ready for life challenges, college ready, and there's also a challenge to make sure that the mathematics you see is, is relevant. So I'm wondering how this flight out to the web is going to work this time. So um, I'm still brave enough to try it. What do you think? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So there is um, an individual out there that you um, it has an interesting website called Gapminder.org. It's an um, exciting website where it uses a particular um, way of looking at, at, um, at data. Um, so let's, let's try this out. And uh, let me need to put the URL L. And I can tell you that even People with PhDs in mathematics get very engaged with this, as well as 12-year-olds. That's my data set. So you should be seeing uh, a loading up of something called Wealth and Health of Nations. It takes a little bit of time to initialize because it's pulling up data. And right now, you should be seeing a website that on the left says Wealth and Health of Nations an explanation of the graph, and then you should see a scatter set of colored dots. What I'd like you all to do is to go down to the lower left corner um, of the graph where it says play, and there's an arrow, and press on that to play. And just watch. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'll give you some feedback. Have people seen some dots moving? Yes, great. So what I'd like you to think about for a moment is if you had just shown your students that clip of data, what are some questions you think they would have? And what are some questions that you would like to ask them uh, to push a, a mass learning outcome? Another question is, what are the learning outcomes that are possible from this video? As you're thinking about that, if you're curious, you might want to go to the left-hand um, column where it lists all these countries and pick on your favorite a country that you know something about its history. Um, click it. Click on Japan. Click on China. Click on the United States. And then watch the graph again. Again, as you're watching this, um, I think a, a question I might ask students is, what does it mean when a dot moves up or down? What does it mean when a dot goes left to right? I might ask students, what are the unit rates that I can see on this graph? Um, I also might ask students, what's the general trend when we look at all those, all that data, what's the general trend and what does it tell us about the world? Um, there's lots of different data sets on this website and then if you would look across the top of Gapminder, there is a, a space for teachers. Uh, again, this is one of many possible um, websites that can push uh, learning and inquiry and relevancy for students. Um, there's some um, potentially socially provocative information on here looking at you know, global, global health issues, um, income equity issues um, that um, might be excellent ways to engage with students with with questions that um, engage them in their world. Okay, so let's head back. So um, I, I was also hoping that if I use this tool in my classroom, I could ask students what else you want to know and push them to think about how they can make graphs to represent their own collected data. What would that look like? Okay, so let's just talk a little bit more about uh, manipulatives that are available um, to you as, as teachers. Are there resources out there that people are putting together? And then we'll talk a little bit more about some actual people who are working hard to create lessons that might be useful for you. So um, one exciting website um, is this website, um, nlvm.usu. And what they've put together is they've created hands-on learning with the common manipulatives you might see in classrooms. They've created online versions of them. So again, um, manipulatives are highly recommended for students building algebraic understanding, getting as many manipulatives in there for students to use when they're looking at patterns. But as we want students to be able to be computer savvy, um, there's manipulatives online for them to, to work with. There's also uh, GeoGebra, and GeoGebra is a heavily um, user-supported site where faculty work hard to create uh, worksheets and online tools. And again, I think this is a website that we need to, to, to visit to, to actually see what it looks like. So let's take a look at it together.
Okay, so GeoGebra is a pretty busy website. Um, people are really excited about the different tools that they 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 make. Um, and the first thing I go to is I go to the I go to the search and I look for something like uh, ratios. And ratios um, come up, and all of these different ideas to play around a little bit are their animations. This is a more challenging website where there's student work there's student worksheets and that these are all they're they're user generated. So you can log in, you can register, or you can keep a track of your own ideas. But these again are online um, manipulative um, learning experience where students can play around. Let's go to another site like this. It's a little bit more, how do you say, it's more calm. This is Desmos. Again, if you click on Launch Calculator, um, this tool um, lets students look at linear graphing and plotting points. Um, for example, um, you can enter in ordered pairs, um, and you can see them plotted. But follow me right now. Is it true that no one can see what I'm typing? Yeah, right. So let's see. Let me try something else. It doesn't help. I am trying. I'm trying to look at um, application sharing. Can you see this down? Yes. It's starting. I think it's starting to load now, Karen. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Good suggestion, Tyler. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. So I'm launching a calculator. Can let me know if people can see this. You should see a grid, a coordinate plane. Is it visible to people? Yes. Can you see it? Okay. So I'm going to plot points by just plotting what I know is ordered pairs, and they show up on this coordinate grid. And these ordered pairs are coming from that pattern showed way back when. When the, on the first stage there were six blocks, on the second stage there were ten blocks, on the fourth stage. There were 18 blocks, and students. Oops. Students can plot points, and they can say, "Wait a second! You know, these these ordered pairs from that pattern are seeming to line up, and they can look at trying to get a graph that would go through those points." And um, they can experiment, um, or they can be deterministic. So again, um, Desmos is a tool where students can um, practice with looking at different kinds of of, uh, of graphs, and even noticing that things are um, are the same. For example, um, when I was looking at that pattern, I was seeing columns. I was seeing there, there's there's two sets of two things, but one's one higher than the other. So I might have written my formula in this way to represent my thinking, and you know, lo and behold, it goes through 
is no different than writing the equation the second way. So again, Desmos is a, a tool that um, if you have computer access for your students or students have phone access, um, smartphone access, um, or computer access in their, in, in their lives, they can experiment with algebraic thinking and graphs. I wonder how to go back to you all. Thank you. Whoever did that. Okay. All right. So this is the a space that I'm glad we're saving these slides and we can look at these five locations are working hard uh, to create mathematical lessons that are available and coordinated um, for, for teachers. So the first one, Illustrative Math Project, is directly supported um, by the Common Core st Standards. Um, the, there's, there's resources going towards it. Um, there's, teachers working on lessons, there's um, people editing and, and curating these sites so that these lessons are coordinated to outcomes in the Common Core Standards. And they have um, a very organized and easily searchable site. I might go there first to look at lessons that I'm going to bring into my class next week. They're, they're clean, they've been edited, and, um, and they're easy to find. The same was on Inside Mathematics. We were there um, earlier where they were having videos to represent um, how practices look, what they look like in classrooms. They also have a, a site that has um, coordinated lessons to common core outcomes. And let's look at the, the next um, three here. Um, the Scottsdale, um, the Scottsdale Community College Again, we talked about that earlier. They wanted to create lessons that had common constructs, common language, and they've, their, their resources, their textbooks are downloadable, they're Creative Commons licensed, and um, they go from basic arithmetic, arithmetic all the way to trigonometry. So again, that's um, resources that you can access and, and use. On that. And then particularly the Scottsdale Community College, they didn't do the, the work to link to the Common Core State Standards, but their work is very well organized, very searchable, and it has a very um, particular consistent flavor. Let's go down here to the Southern Regional Education Board. They've also um, created a text um, thinking about the needs for um, adult learners um, in community colleges coming back to the workforce, getting ready to be college ready, and they've created a a downloadable text as well that's available for use. Then this last site here, the MAP assessment project, those are tasks that um, are intentionally written to be more open-ended, more problem-solving based, and additionally on their website they have resources to support your own professional development. So let's just review. These first two are definitely organized, supported by Common Core State Standards funds, and meant to make it easier for instructors K through 12, K through 20, to be teaching consistently to the, the standards, the outcomes, and the practices that support the big picture thinking that helps students be successful in careers in college. Um, these two websites are open source textbooks. Um, the, you can print out pages, they're not interactive, uh, but they have they're incredible resources, um, well, well put together and well, well edited. The Southern Regional Education Board resources um, are, again, pushed for more, some more open-ended tasks and some more um, problem-solving focus. And then the MARS tasks are tasks that are specifically designed to push um, for problem-solving thinking and to create tasks that allow for assessment, um, formative assessment of where students' thinking is. And particularly, um, there's um, 
professional development support on that side to say, here are some ideas you might want to use to support your thinking, to read with a colleague, and to push your practice um, up to the, the next level that you imagine. Okay, so that's that's where I'm at, and I'm trying to. There's so much information to share, and the real point is that to respond to, to change, we have to have dialogue. I've been pushing a lot of information towards you. Um, I've had the time and reflection as I think about how I'm going to pro approach doctoral questions to really think about what sources might help you, um, but in, in your practice. But this is really about your dialogue. And as you go through this process, you're going to have questions and wonders. And I want to encourage you all to, to think about how to create a professional community of practice around you and elicit the support so you can have these um, professional dialogues um, that support you thinking how to respond to this change. Adopting any of these ideas in this webinar um, is worthy of talking with a colleague about and asking them to visit your class so you can talk about um, what, you know, how the students were engaged and talk about your own process. So with that, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. It looks like there's a question from Christy Knighton. Um, I'd love to read more about the ineffectiveness of IRE and alternatives to remedial pedagogy. Can you direct me to some research? I would look at Kazemi, K-A-Z-E-M-I. He's done some effective um, talking about what it means to be press and not press and has some um, articles that are both long and five page short summaries of what they what he's seen in classrooms or some dialogues he's recorded and created transcripts. And um, the other the other researcher who's well known as uh, Gutierrez, um, her first name is begins with a K. She's done work on discourse. And um, if you if you put in IRE, IRF, discourse into Google Scholar, you'll get a lot of literature as well. But Academy is where I would start in terms of the most you know, the most recent thinking. We can we can follow up with some of that and, and put it in the blog when we in addition to the recording archive link to this talk. So. That's important, though, because it is nuanced, because there's nothing wrong with asking a question, a student responding, answering, and then you responding as a teacher. The issue is, what's necessary in your response to push student thinking forward? And, and that people have done some good thinking about that. Um, Christy made another comment um, about allowing all voices to be heard, which, Christy, uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's critical in all the voices of the teachers. So you're, you're in the classroom. You, have, you are the practitioners. You are working with these students. You know, your experiences, um, they matter. Your voices need to be heard as you, you know, grapple with getting students ready um, and basic skills for the GED test, but also college and the career. And your students, they all, their thinking all matters. Um, that makes me uh, want to recommend a book, um, which is called um, Smarter Together. It's written by Featherstone et al. And it's about the techniques needed to support um, complex instruction to really think about how to actually include whatever the techniques you need to include every voice. Um, so I just said I, I will get some resources that um, Karen thinks are strong, and I'll link that to the recording and, the, and Karen's other resources to the ATL blog. 
and built us you, together. <laughs> yeah, well, I just I put smarter together so that didn't work. Uh, did oh. you lose the slide with the Bitly address, and did you just put it in the chat window, or do we? Where's oh, that slide? I've, I've just been periodically putting it into the. the I've been putting the um, the Bitly link in, into the chat window. Okay. I don't well, think I ever got a gonna... slide. <laughs> Sorry about well, that. Well, there, there was one, but yeah. Oh, I see. That's right. We just did a private page. Okay. But anyway, that doesn't, doesn't matter. Well, uh, Karen, I want to thank you very much for taking the time today. This has been very helpful in the, for us. I think there's a lot to take in, and, but I, we will be following up, I think, to help see how we might uh, encourage uh, folks to create some local conversations. I think there's... I think there's going to be some work related to this on the, at the rendezvous meeting this summer that uh, Megan Luce and Mike Nevins are going to be helping with, and so we'll we'll find ways. And working with uh, Susan Kidd and Beth Wheeler at uh, the state board office, we'll find some ways to help keep this dialogue and conversation going. So appreciate you kicking things off for us. Absolutely. And Christy Jones said, I'd love to discuss this more at Rendezvous. And as Bill, yes, absolutely. As Bill, pointed, as Bill said, there will definitely be some interaction about this at Rendezvous. And I just wanted to say Luann Ludberg wrote, thanks. I feel like I've learned about some wonderful resources. And so it's nice to thank you, Luann, thank for you, that feedback. I went in high, guys. I said I'm going to you know, put out what, the ideas that might, you know, push us and want us, you know, to instigate more conversation. This is not easy, but it's rewarding work. Absolutely. Rewarding and Karen, work. thank you for taking risks with us um, today with the technology. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I think that's great. Yeah. If you don't you take risks in public, how can you ask your students to do math in front of you? Absolutely. And Tyler just wrote, thank you. This is a great start to important conversation about our teaching practice with GED and beyond. And beyond. Absolutely, Tyler. Absolutely. Well, Karen, thank you. Bill, do you have any final words you want to say? Nope, I just did. Thanks, Karen. Okay, you Appreciate said them. <laughs> My pleasure. Yes. Take care. <laughs> All right, we'll be in touch, Karen. Take care. All right, everyone. Bye-bye. You can stop the recording now. <laughs> I know, I'm just about to stop it. <laughs>